Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today feels like already a very special day with so many twos, two twenty-two, twenty-two. So amazing. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. If you are new to Ascender Space, welcome. We're really excited to have you. Uh, if this is not your first time here and I see so many uh, friendly faces, welcome back. It's also very nice to see you again. My name is Anja Lehmann, Innovation Director here at Ascender. But without further ado, I want to pass it on to Sophia Fang. We are very excited to have Sophia again. Uh, for those of you who, who may know her, she is the head of marketing at Honeycomb Credit. Um, if you don't know Honeycomb Credit, you have to uh, Google it right now. Uh, they also are a, a local startup that helps um, many no, a number of entrepreneurs through crowdfunding. So Sophia can tell us a little bit more about that. And Sophia is just like an all around rock star that likes to give back, help entrepreneurs and is a whiz when it comes to marketing. So with that in mind, Sophia, I'm gonna hand it over to you so you can tell us a little bit more about you and your background and what we can expect uh, in the workshop today. Awesome, thank you so much for the amazing introduction. I, and uh, it, it's so great to be back. Uh, I think I did my first workshop at, at a center right when COVID hit. <laughs> so very much of a full circle moment here. So really excited to be talking about um, email marketing, especially today. Uh, it's, it's a core part of um, how we drive investments and um, across the platform um, at Honeycomb. And I think at large, especially in this um, highly digital world, it's still one of the most powerful ways to get your message out to the people who have the highest intent to work with you or buy what you're selling. Um, and uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, I joined Honeycomb about three and a half years ago. So uh, we had just gone through um, Alpha Lab, um, had just run our first campaign with Millie's Ice Cream. Um, so it, it was very much um, a, a journey of building a lot of the marketing um, foundations and channels from scratch. So um, I've definitely learned a lot and also failed many times um, in the past um, few years. Um, so I'm really excited to um, share a little bit more about some of my discoveries um, through email. Um, when I had just joined Honeycomb, we had a newsletter about less than a thousand people. And since then we've grown it to about 19,000. Um, um, and you know, at that point I had never made a marketing email before. I had heard of MailChimp um, and, and some of the platforms that had never done it myself. So just really want to stress the idea that this is something, regardless of your background in marketing or sending emails in itself, it, it's something that you can start doing bite size um, in a way that really fits with your business goals. So for today, uh, we're going to talk through a little bit of the email marketing foundations. Like what are the key components that you really need to define to um, start building that infrastructure? We'll talk a little bit about um, the, the nuggets and the secret sauce to crafting your first email or your next email. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you measure the results and really understand the metrics of how the email is performing. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll share a little bit about strategies to scale and grow these efforts. Uh, and you know, throughout this time, I, you know, we, we have a couple of smaller interactive and like individual exercises for you to um, try alongside and um, get the creative juices flowing. Um, so before I dive into uh, the, yeah, the foundations, I just wanted to give a quick intro an outline of Honeycomb as well, because you know, I'll be sharing some examples um, that we've used uh, and just wanted to talk a little bit about the audience that we're marketing towards. Um, so at Honeycomb, we really believe in unlocking growth opportunities for small businesses you know, to build vibrant, financially empowered communities. And we do this by you know, connecting small businesses that are looking for growth loans and expansion loans um, with folks in the community, their customers, their fans, people who want to support local. Um, so, you know, these individual community members um, invest in the small businesses, the businesses get the capital to grow, um, and then they eventually pay the loan back um, to the uh, investors. So um, from an email marketing side, um, we do a lot of um, B2C or business to consumer to our um, investor newsletter 
um, to you know let them know about new campaigns coming up and the reasons why they should invest. Um, and then on the business owner side, it's a little bit more of a concentrated lead generation funnel, you know, where we're bringing people in, we're nurturing them through a lot of educational content about why they should work with Honeycomb um, and, you know, ultimately get them to launch a campaign. So those are kind of the two markets that we, we straddle. And there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of relationships and connections between the two. Uh, I think for this presentation, I'll probably talk a little bit more about the investor side of the market because that, you know, consumer facing uh, audience uh, is most likely parallels um, probably a lot of the audiences that you all work with. So let's get started. So the very first thing uh, and, you know, that we really need to understand is, you know, what is the point of an email, right? And it seems very obvious at first, right? Like I'm, I'm setting stuff, I'm letting people know I'm, I'm getting buzzed. Uh, but, you know, it's really important to understand that, you know, email marketing is a powerful middle or bottom of the funnel tool. Like no one's probably going it, to, it's probably no one's first touch point, right? Because, you know, when we're thinking about how people find out about your business, that uh, initial stage of awareness, they're probably coming in because of social media, like maybe their friends told you about, told them about you um, through word of mouth. Maybe they saw an ad. Uh, you know, maybe they saw a news article about you. So that's kind of the point where they initially um, hear and find out about you. And then, you know, maybe they go to their, your website next and they want to learn more. And um, through the various um, actions that you can craft, you can give them opportunities to um, give um, you their email address um, and really start this consideration and decision-making process. So this is where we kind of talk about, you know, um, it, it, the analogy to um, dating, right? You're kind of vetting each other, um, going on those first initial dates, um, figuring each, um, uh, you know, each other out um, before making that decision of, okay, I'm going to buy this thing or I'm going to work with you. So um, emails are really, really valuable in both the consideration and the decision-making phases. And it's important to keep in mind the, the one single purpose of an email is to drive your audience towards your call to action, whatever that might be. Uh, you're not just you know, sending things and not get, allowing the people an uh, opportunity to convert and um, learn more. And you know, I think the key parts of this, um, it's twofold. There's the audience part and then there's the call to action part. So um, some of the potential goals that you might have to direct people towards that action is, you know, maybe you want to relationship build more, um, you know, maybe, you know, I want to set up a, a startup mentor newsletter to let all the folks I've talked to um, know, like, you know, how they can support my startup or my business. Um, maybe you want to build brand awareness. So um, letting them know more about what you do, um, potentially driving sales. Uh, you know, if I have an online store, um, I, I can put in front of them the, the products that I can have people look at and buy immediately. Um, you know, if you're you're working with more of a business audience than like qualifying leads, um, you know, giving them information um, to uh, and ways to interact with you, whether it's downloading a white paper or coming to an event, uh, allowing folks to engage with you a little bit more deeply. Um, those are all actions that, you know, tell us as a marketing team um, that they're, they're getting closer to that decision making part. Uh, and then finally, maybe if, if content is a big part of your marketing, if you write blogs, if you create videos, TikToks, so whatever that might be, um, it's a great way to point people towards it. So um, always keep in mind what's the purpose of that email and what, what is that singular and tangible action you want people to take. Now, this next part is the audience, right, the, that goes hand in hand. And uh, I think it's, you know, when you're starting off, probably just building that newsletter is your initial goal. Uh, or maybe, you know, you're thinking about creating more intentional segments um, of your audiences and, and creating emails directly to them. So um, if you're starting off with building your email list um, for the first time, um, start thinking about, you know, what are some of those existing sources of email addresses? Um, it could be as simple as you know going through your Gmail inbox and finding the people that you've 
corresponded with um, and sticking them uh, on the newsletter. And, you know, I think in, especially in the early days, like, don't worry too much about, oh, like, do they want to receive this email or like, you know, I'm scared they're going to unsubscribe. Like people, people will leave the worst case that they do as they click unsubscribe. And like, once you get over that fear, then it's, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, and, you know, once you have built up that existing list, um, then you can also start creating these automated ways for people to opt in, right? You, you want to, I'm, I'm kind of imagining that um, analogy of, you know, maybe a water slide or, or a roller coaster. You want people to be able to just do it by themselves and then land in your email newsletter um, instead of having to do it manually. Um, so one of the smartest and just like most um, low hanging fruit ways of doing that is, you know, having a website newsletter sign up um, on your on your website. Um, so at Honeycomb, we have the newsletter sign up um, across every single page um, on our Flutter to really make sure, you know, like no matter where they land, um, they have a chance to um, sign up for it. Um, we also do an exit intent um, pop up, which basically, you know, if you seen those when you first join a site you you see a little box that pops up of you know join this offer or um you know sign up for 10 percent um there, there's different ways that you can trigger that action as well so um one thing that we like to do is the exit intent which is when someone's just about to click the x um x out of the browser um this thing pops up and uh, encourages people to um, so, yes, um, sign up. So in general, we get about five to 10 signups um, per day, just having this very low touch, uh, like sign up option on the website. Um, you know, you might also want to create an email integration, say if you have an um, e-commerce site like Shopify or Squarespace or Square uh, and have things integrate directly um, into your email list. So you're, um, every time you have a customer, um, it also continues to build that up and um, creates opportunities for them to come back as a repeat. Um, you could also do um, the social media signups. Um, so for some folks, they might have a link on their Instagram um, that you click and um, it's a really easy way to um, you know, sign up. Like, especially if you're in that um, stealth mode stage or before you um, launch into the market, like having these like simple ways um, for people to join um, is a way to build that email list, um, you know, even before you're in the market itself. And then finally, um, if you have the resources, creating downloadable um, free content is also a great way to do so. Um, so, you know, it, it can be as lightweight as, you know, say this um, webinar right now that's being uh, recorded. You, you have that really great recording now. Um, maybe, um, you know, put it, lock it up uh, with a very simple uh, sign up button where people just need to put in their email address to access the recording later. Um, yeah, so it, it doesn't have to be building content from scratch. It could be things that you're already doing um, and just recycling and reusing it um, in a clever way. So here to the right, um, the top is a webinar that we had done um, to help support small business owners with um, preparing for Small Business Saturday um, in th that first um, like pandemic holiday. Um, so we had done this as a live webinar. Um, and if someone afterwards wants to watch it, they just put in their email, click watch now, and they get an automated email um, that links to the recording. And then, yeah, the bottom here is what the Flutter newsletter sign up looks like. Now here's time for our very first um, individual brainstorm exercise. So we've talked a little bit about the key importance of you know really making sure you're driving the um, you know the right people um, at the right time um, to the place um, you want them to take the action. So uh, we're going to you know grab some pen and paper and let's spend three minutes um, brainstorming individually uh, uh, with the following three questions. Right. So. First of all, you know, think a little bit about your businesses and um, where you are um, in your marketing journey, uh, and you know, think a little bit about you know who is the top audience um, of your email newsletter um, that you want to convert the most. Um, so maybe list um, either three or four um, customer segments, um, or you know, if you're building more of an individual-based um, newsletter, write down a couple of the, the names of folks. Um, that you would want to add to your um, newsletter. 
Um, you know, secondly, think about what's the goal that you want to achieve with your audience, broadly speaking, right? Is it brand awareness? Is it driving sales? Um, is it, you know, getting them, delivering them content? And then the third piece is, you know, what are one or three specific actions that you want them to take, right? You know, if, if say it's a piece of content, um, maybe, you know, it's, I want them to, to create this, you know, email newsletter or um, go towards this um, specific PDF um, and, you know, where you want them to land um, on your website. Um, so I'm going to put um, three minutes on the clock um, if folks are ready. Uh, but you know, before that, also just wanted to open it up if if anyone had any questions um, about this, the questions themselves. Okay, awesome then. Uh, let's get started then, and three minutes starts now. All right, that's time. Um, anyone in the audience wants to you know share what you came up with? All right, that's chill too. <laughs> I can I can share a little bit about you know because uh, I wrote down some notes um, myself too. Um, so, oh yeah, please okay. go for it. Um, I I produce uh, high end wood surfaces for the architectural market. That's my business, and um, I'm relaunching my website and and uh, should be ready by the end by the beginning of April, but. My audience is architects, interior designers, architectural woodworkers, and fine furniture makers. Um, and the goal, I think, is, is just primarily a relationship. Architecture tends to be a very long, drawn-out process. You know, they're, they're, they're first going to... And, and the, the stuff I offer is they've never seen it before. So this is a brand new surface. So it's a it's a long drawn out process. I need to just get in the door and start the conversation. So that's kind of my primary goal for the emails. And then um, the actions, it, call me, email me, uh, ask for a sample, something like that. Yeah, I love that. And uh, thinking a little bit about how, how long that relationship building is, I, I, I love that you connected it to it. And, you know, it, it seems like um, especially that you're doing some this type of innovative material, um, really, you know, pointing them towards understanding, you know, like why this is better than everything else in the market or what makes it really stand out. I think that could really help your um, email stand out too. Thank you. Great. Yeah, great. And did I see um, Toko um, also raised your hand to, to you know, sh share your exercise? Yeah. Um... I'm sorry, I have, I'm having issues with my camera and also my little ones are here, so you may hear some noise. But um, so I have a um, online store that sells Afrocentric casual clothes. And for my audience, I've come up with African immigrants. Um, African immigrants, female African Americans ages 22 to 45 male African-Americans who are into African culture, women who like expressive bright colored clothing regardless of race and spouses of black people, this is my, um, I feel like they may wanna share in on um, their spouse's culture. Mm -hmm. And then the goal of my newsletters would be to bring about brand awareness. Um, There's so, a crowded market, so just to have people know me, um, obviously get sales, <laughs> I need sales. Um, and then I'd also like reviews. And then a part of my business is helping people understand what um, middle-class everyday African culture is. And I'll be doing that through my YouTube channel. Um, so I would also like to direct people to my YouTube page. Um, so with actions, I have people buying leaving reviews, hopefully with email images and subscribing to my YouTube channel. Yeah, I, I loved all the research you've done on, on the different demographics. And yeah, it sounds like um, social media could be a really fantastic feeder um, into figuring out your audience and then maybe having um, that email sign up um, be the next call to action. Or potentially maybe like if social is enough, just having that sale directly 
um, uh, yeah, from social might be a, a good strategy. Uh, but I, I also love that you brought up reviews because I think that could be a, a really um, great one for email marketing, especially if you catch them right after they make their purchase, um, having a, some kind of automated email um, structure to to send out those like, hey, I hope you um, love you know your pro like you know my product you know can you leave a review? Um, that seems like a you know a really smart way to include some of the um, the, yeah that um, technological aid to help um, drive the, all the great reviews to your business. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Awesome. Oh yeah, that was really great. Um, you know, thank you, Toko and. Um, Jeff, we're both sh um, sharing. That was really amazing. Uh, and we're going to move. Uh, we're going to move on to the next piece now. So we've had a chance to talk a little bit about the audience and what are the high level goals and actions that we want to point people towards. Um, so next up, we're going to dive into creating that email itself and um, some of the tools and um, the things to really think about when you're um, building your first or next email. So first and foremost, um, the first thing that you should be doing is really defining your um, email strategy. So um, kind of like what we um, were you know, talking about in the exercise, right? Like we, we, um, based on the people that you're trying to reach and where they normally hang out, um, think a little bit about what, um, what is the best thing you can put forth in front of them that they'd be most interested in and really drives them towards um, making that decision. So um, depending on you know, your business model and your structure, there's a lot of different um, you know, types of email campaigns that you could be running. Um, you know, if you're more of a you know, software um, service, um, then maybe just having you know, product release announcements or announcements and company announcements um, might be enough um, you know, whenever those things come out. Um, if you are a, a business that creates a, a lot of content, you know, like how Togo has a YouTube channel and uh, like ha has, you know, you can turn those maybe into more bite-sized pieces and link them in your email. Um, you know, if you, you know, get featured in a lot of news articles and um, you have that educational content, those are things that you can put forth in front of your customers to really build their trust um, in you. Um, if you events are a big um, part of what you do, like at a sender, right? Um, then the, putting events um, into your newsletter is also a great option. Um, as well as you know, if you're more of a um, direct to consumer, um, maybe creating like timely seasonal offers. If the holidays are coming up, um, and creating deals and promotions, those are all potential. Um, options that you can um, do. And uh, it's also, you know, you don't have to just do one or the other, right? You can experiment across time to see what truly works um, for your model. And then, you know, the, the next part of this is also determining your um, email cadence, right? Like, are you someone who is going to send an email once a week, um, a couple of times per week? You know, you might even go daily uh, or something a little bit uh, less, in, uh, you know, less frequently. Um, so I, I think in terms of determining this, it's really a, a combination of figuring out, um, you know, what's the cadence of touch points um, that will keep you top of mind, uh, but also keeping in mind your your own resources, right? Like if you're the um, if you're a one person business right now and you can only send an email out once a month, like that's great. Like start with that. Um, one email is better than no emails um, at all through the month. Um, so, you know, set these tangible and bite-sized goals um, based uh, and try to find that balance between um, what you're able to produce and um, what your audience might look like. And, you know, as you can, as you grow, you can also amp those things up. So just wanted to stress, you know, if, uh, even if something like daily is the ideal goal, um, starting small, um, starting bite-sized will eventually help you get there. Now, next up, um, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what platform you actually want to send these emails um, towards. Um, so I, I always say start scrappy and start small, um, it, like, you know, with Gmail. So at, actually at Honeycomb, our very first newsletter was our, you know, startup mentor newsletter that um, George and Ken, our, our co-founders, um, created to, you know, really 
uh, when, you know, when they were out there talking to um, mentors at like Ascender and Alpha Lab and across Pittsburgh, um, they were meeting and getting a lot of business cards. So um, they pretty much, you know, recorded all of those down and um, just sent a very simple text email uh, maybe once a month, but letting all the mentors know like, hey, here's the things that we've been working on. Um, like this is how here are our asks. Um, and if you know, you know, a person who can do X, Y, Z, like, please just send them over to, um, to us. So um, at that point in time, it, it was a, a really good and what they were able to do. And um, a, as I say, again, you know, one email is better than no email. Um, so they really started with that um, really simple foundation. Um, you know, as we were getting um, building up our um, investor newsletter and getting a lot more people interested in investing, uh, when I joined, um, I think they were you know starting to use Mailchimp. Um, so it's probably one of the best um, like freemium model email marketing where um, you know you go in, you have drag and drop um, options to um, really craft that email, um, and then you can send it out. So I believe with with Mailchimp, it's uh, under under the free uh, membership, um, it's up to two thousand contacts. So if you're starting small, like it, it's a really great and lightweight um, option um, that that has a very great product features. Um, I think the the only small trade off is on the on the free version, you can't schedule emails out. So uh, like before a future date, so um, you'll probably have to um, you know send it out on live time if that's something important to you. Um, and then, you know, besides MailChimp, there are also also uh, um, a lot of other like subscription based um, email marketing services. So um, they tend to range from, you know, like $10 to um, $50 um, per month. Um, so depending on your needs um, and wants, um, it's, there are, you know, it's a very, um, I think, a crowded market. So, <laughs> so um, if, if you search it up, there's like, you know, top 50 email marketing softwares and a lot of guides um, to really figure out what's best for you. Um, that being said, you know, like if you're like for your business, um, having an integrated marketing and sales pipeline is important to you, um, then I think it, it will be really valuable to graduate up to a CR, CRM platform or customer relationship platform. Um, to really be able to fully track everyone from the very first touch point to the decision making process. Um, so like one of the uh, one of the first things that I did um, at Honeycomb was move us towards um, uh, towards HubSpot because at that point, you know, we, we had um, a separate software for sending sales outreach and then we also had MailChimp and it was really difficult sometimes to be able to connect and patch the two together um, and figure out where people were unless we were like manually exporting or importing the spreadsheets of like, you know, these are people um, who have, are on marketing side. So don't send them um, on the sales side or, or vice versa. Um, so so it, like, you know, once you're at a scale where you, you need that streamlined process of, you know, we need to get someone from point A to point um, Z, um, then I think having a customer relationship management platform that has email sending um, technicalities um, it will probably be the right move for it. And I um, just really want to emphasize that it's really important to lay that groundwork um, early on um, so that um, in the future when you need that full visibility, that full tracking and reporting um, to you know, see how, how many leads did we get um, this week uh, and run those reports um, to, so that you already have that foundation um, instead of having to build it up a, a little bit later. Cause you know, it gets, uh, the more mature you are as a um, company, the more complicated it, it gets to really re relink those things. Um, so again, yeah, grow into your needs. So um, if you, um, you know, if you are currently in that um, Gmail phase, then um, start doing that. And um, once you feel like, you know, you're starting to build that traction, then maybe graduate to MailChimp or so on and so forth. So uh, always, you know, maybe think one step ahead of where you want to be um, infrastructurally wise um, to decide on the best platform for you. Now, um, next up, we once we you know have picked our platform and we know what we're going to send people, um, here's when we can start crafting our first um, email. Um, so, uh, in terms of the key parts of creating e creating an email, I think that the first thing that people see 
is going to be that subject line. Um, so it, it's really important to craft something that's you know concise, um, pithy, and the really you know piques the curiosity of people to want to click because right like if if it's boring and people don't even click on your email then the rest of this it doesn't even matter like they're they're never going to see it um so you know test you can play around with different subject lines and try something that's you know slightly clickbaity but you know not not too clickbaity uh and really um, test things out because you know it, it has to be enough for someone to say okay i, I want to you know read more about what this is um, next up, something that I really stress um, in creating the, the copy, especially, is um, re really creating like concise and, and cogent and, and be straight to the point. Um, on average, I think there's been research that's been done that um, you know someone only focuses about like eight seconds on something before they decide I'm going to look at something else or I'm going to keep looking at it. So uh, especially with um, in a world where you, know, you can imagine a lot of people are um, opening and reading emails on their mobile devices or, you know, just scrolling really quickly through. Um, we only have, you know, five to eight seconds. So really make those things um, count. And so, you know, try, try not to write giant paragraphs. Um, if that's the case, maybe that's something you actually want to um, link to a, as your call to action to something that's a little bit more long form. And then, you know, another, I think the, the third key component of this is really understanding that call to action that we talked about, um, right? Like, do you want them to go to a campaign page? You know, do you want them to, to go to um, your online shop? Um, really understanding what that like singular call to action um, you want to point people towards um, and then make sure to um, create multiple points across the, the body text. Um, to get there. So generally, I would recommend, you know, only pointing like people to one thing in, in one email section uh, across the board. Um, if every single link is goes to something that's different, um, then it gets really chaotic and, you know, people are landing in different places um, and they're not going down the path that you want to, to direct them towards. Um, so, you know, I always stress like, you know, in one email section, do one singular call to action, but link multiple times and make everything that's possible um, clickable towards that point. So, um, you know, it gives more opportunities and more ways for people to land in the same place. So here's an example of a one of the email sections that we have on our investor newsletter um, for Harvey Farms. Um, so they're also a Pittsburgh based um, company that connects um, like local farms and um, produce from them and deliver do home delivery um, to to folks um, across the uh, across Pittsburgh and you know they they were working with us to really grow um, and raise some funds to um, expand their model nationally. So th this is um, you know Simon here um, who's the the founder of uh, Harry Farms. So we start off um, with with our branding. We really focus on featuring you know real business owners in their real spaces and building that human connection so we have a picture of Simon doing his deliveries um, and you know in in the copy we you know we really thought about um, you know from an investor or your customer standpoint right what are the things that make them want to invest um, or you know want to buy our products um, so for us for example we know that um, our investors, um, their main motivations for investing um, usually lies on a spectrum of, you know, like, I want to help support my community and local businesses um, to, you know, I want a good return on my investment. So everyone's somewhere on that spectrum. Um, and based on that, we know that, you know, for the community bleeding heart folks, they're going to care more about, you know, this is a rising entrepreneur and this is how I can help them and help create their vision versus, you know, for folks who are maybe more ROI focused, they're going to think a little bit more, um, you know, about, you know, what are my returns? Like, how can I tell that this is going to be a successful deal um, and things like that. So um, that's why, you know, in this copy here, if you're, if you're able to see, we, we kind of try to combine both of those voices, right? So um, we talk about the, the importance of fresh food um, and, you know, how you can help, um, um, Simon on his journey. Um, at the same time, we put in a lot of numbers to really showcase the proof, right? Like 
152 other people have put their money on into this investment. So um, chances are, you know, that's going to sway me to become investor number 5153. Um, and we also drop a lot of the stats here around, you know, they're working with 200 farms and over 150,000 customers. They've already delivered a million boxes um, last year, and they want to serve 5 million families by 2030. So, um, you know, in, in just three sentences, um, <laughs> I know it's, it's a lot of thinking probably to put to just write three sentences. Um, but, um, you know, when we only have um, eight seconds to um, draw someone's attention in, um, then it's a really valuable endeavor to, to do so. Uh, and as you can tell from all of the, the highlights and the yellow call to action buttons, um, each one of these link to Simon's um, crowdfunding campaign page. So that's where people would go to click invest um, and you know, um, make their investment. So you know, trying to make um, as many different things clickable, um, it gives more people opportunity to jump through. And I think the, the ultimate thing to keep in mind is your email really needs to answer the question, you know, why should I, the customer, the reader, want to learn more about this? So keep that in mind as you're crafting whatever that um, whatever email um, you're building. Now, um, you know, we, we've started sending out the emails. We're starting to build um, our email list. You know, people are coming in. Uh, from our newsletter sign up, uh, and now you know it's we're really in that phase of scaling and growing our email marketing um, efforts. So one of the you know one of the great things that I love to do. Um, wait, did I skip a page? Ah, I, I knew I skipped. I was like, we we haven't talked about the metrics yet. Um, scroll back a little bit, but this is this part is very important. Um, so you know after you you know send out the emails. Um, really understanding how people interact and engage with the email will help you with your efforts um, and really understand what your audience likes um, or dislikes. So I, I've listed here a couple of the, the most common um, email analytics that like platforms sh should just be able to um, give to you. And um, first and foremost, there's the open rate. Um, so very simple calculation. It's the number of people who open the emails divided by the total number of people that you know got the email delivered. Uh, and um, honestly, this is probably the, the most uh, accurate measurement of like how engaging your subject line is, right? Because at that point, um, the subject line is pretty much the only thing that determines um, you know, if pe someone's going to open it out, like open it. So, um, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's useful, um, but only for that very short string of text. So definitely keep that part, um, in mind. Um, uh, another, um, analytic is the click through rate, which is the number of clicks, um, divided by, you know, the number of total delivers. Uh, and, you know, this measures engagement, but, uh, like it, it, there, it, there's a little bit of a caveat, um, to it. Um, in that, you know, th this shows the number of clicks um, divided by like everyone out there, right? So if I have one click um, out of 100 people, um, but, you know, only 10 people opened it, right? That's a very different picture than if 85 people opened that email and only one person uh, opened, uh, like clicked on something in the email. So it's, it's a good measurement for like overall how things are engaging, but it doesn't show the full picture, right, of, you know, from everyone who got delivered to everyone who opened it up to, you know, how many people actually clicked on the stuff. Um, there, the calculations would be different, um, but for the two cases that I mentioned, both of them would have a 1% click-through rate, which doesn't really show the full picture of what's happening. So what I advise and what you know, most email marketing um, platforms are currently doing is the click to open rate or CTOR, sometimes it's written um, that way. So um, it's the number of clicks um, divided by the total number of people who've actually opened the email. So it narrows it down just to the audience of people who've actually you know, engaged and read through that eight seconds um, of what um, you've written and who also clicked on the email itself. So um, I would say this is a more accurate um, measurement of engagement. So if you were to pick two, my suggestion would probably be, um, you know, click to open rates is the top. 
Um, and then open rate is also good you know, to, to test out that subject line. Um, some of the other terms that you, you might see thrown around is you know, the unsubscribe rate. So how many, how many people unsubscribe you know, from the total number of um, delivers? I wouldn't stress too much about this, you know, unless if you're hitting maybe 5% or higher, uh, but, you know, people unsubscribing is a very natural thing. And unless if, you know, you it like hurts your um, deliverability rate, um, I wouldn't stress too much about, um, oh no, like, you know, 10 people unsubscribe from this email. Um, it just means, you know, let's think about it from a growth perspective and put like add more people to the newsletter in itself. Um, unsubscribe means, you know, they won't even buy something, won't ever probably even buy something from you. Um, so it's okay if we let them loose. Um, again, yeah, spam rates um, is just like how many of them, how many of your emails get filtered into the spam folders of your recipients. Um, and again, if it's in the, in the low, um, you know, digits, um, it, it's totally fine. I want to stress too much about it. Um, and then, oh yeah, deliverability is, you know, the number of emails you have. This is more about sometimes people type in <laughs> the wrong emails um, or you get like a, a bounce. So it, it just happens. Um, but you know, I wouldn't stress about any of these too much. Um, that being said, you know, sometimes, you know, if you, we generally don't advise, you know, buying lists um, unless, um, you know, you're, you're just doing more of a sales outreach. But on the marketing side, if there is, one of the use cases where you could, you might be penalized negatively is, is if you buy, you know, a list of um, thousands of people who don't even know you um, and then start sending them like marketing focused emails um, that might um, actually hurt your um, ability to send out emails um, in the future. So just something to keep in mind, like, yeah, when sending out mass emails. And then, you know, sometimes um, you can also get some more like deeper insights into how your subscribers are behaving and engaging with your emails. Um, so I, I'm speaking here in terms of what like HubSpot's um, emails um, allows me to see. So it, it can actually show you know, what devices um, did someone um, use to um, read your email? You know, was it mobile? Like, was it um, like an iOS? Um, and those um, so on and so forth. So this can give you some like additional insights, right? Because you know, if I see that seventy percent of my um, of of my audience is using mobile phone to um, read my emails, then I I can start optimizing my um, emails to be you know maybe even more bite sized and quicker. Um, so it's easier to um, read on uh, a phone. You can also see when they open the, the email it, itself um, through the days. Um, I think in, in general, we see that the most opens are within the first 24 hours, but you, you never know. Maybe um, there's a little bit of a, a lag just based on what your audience is. Um, you know, you can see how long they spent reading it. You know, if 90% if of the people only spent two seconds on the email, that's a very different picture than if um, you know, 40%, you know, spent more than um, eight seconds or, you know, a minute even um, reading that email, um, as well as the number of times um, someone opened it up. Um, that can tell us, you know, out of even out of all of the clicks, so who's most engaged with this piece of content, um, especially, you know, if this is something that's going towards um, leads, um, if, if, you know, if this particular business opens the email up like eight times, um, that's probably a good sign that they're, they're really interested in it and we can reach out to them again for you know, maybe to set up a call and you know schedule a demo and something um, yeah that really helps them make that decision. Great. So now this you know this kind of ties back into also just optimizing with customer data in general. Um, beyond that, uh, I think um, you can also use just like customer data in uh, data that you have at, at large to really understand um, how your customers are behaving. So one of the things that you know, a lot of the platforms allow you to do is run an A-B test um, um, of an email. So it basically will say, you know, 50, I can they'll randomly divide your customer list into two separate groups, 50% um, on each. 
Um, and then you have the option to create like a, a version A and a version B where you know one thing, one variable is different across those emails. Um, and then the, the, the platform will send it out um, and then you can do an A-B test. Um, and you know, based on it, if the results are conclusive, you can tell you know, um, that the variable is actually uh, affecting um, you know, and, and optimizing for that. So, you know, maybe for, for us, you know, some of the times we ran A-B test um, testing, you know, is it the number of other investors that gets someone more interested um, or is it, you know, seeing that they're 150% funded already, um, something that um, you can test. So the variables it can, across, can vary across the board. You know, you could try out different subject lines. You could try out different content pieces um, different email links, um, but just keep in mind between the two versions, you can only tweak one thing, right? Because otherwise, if, if I'm tweaking both the subject line um, and like the, the messaging in the body, um, then I, I have multiple variables and I wouldn't be able to tell which one actually um, caused the ultimate results and, and the difference in the opens and the click um, to open rates. Um, and then I think um, if you collect data on your customers in general, so you know, for us with our investors, we, we have, we kind of know, um, uh, you know, first of all, when they invest and what time they invest and, and how much and a lot of these other things uh, about their demographics um, and backgrounds. Um, so one of the things we, we did with our data analytics um, intern for the summer was um, just do a whole deep dive into all of our investor uh, investment data. Um, and one of the things that we found out was that, um, you know, people tend to make um, investments first during weekdays uh, and during work hours. <laughs> um, and usually like at like eight or 9 a.m. Um, their time. Um, and that like, you know, weekends really suck. So, so like low activity. Um, so we, you know, based on that, we started, you know, tweaking and changing our email newsletter to, you know, go out on uh, around that same time. So usually, you know, Tuesday, Thursdays at 8 a.m. or maybe, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, in the early mornings. So, you know, just based on how we knew people um, invested and, you know, shopped on the platform in general, um, we started optimizing our email send times to um, match that. And you know, similarly, uh, one of the emails that we send out is um, like an ending soon um, email. So when a campaign is nearing the final days of their um, campaign, you know, we do one final email blast. Uh, and one of the things we found there was um, just based on when we sent out the email, um, people generally invested one week um, within seven days of when we sent out that last email. So um, in the very early days, and you know, I, I thought, you know, just my hypothesis was, oh, maybe the closer we send it to the ending soon, you know, if they only have two days left, um, maybe that just like brings up more urgency and people are more likely to invest. Um, the data actually told me, you know, our, our hypothesis was wrong. So we actually moved that email to be more like seven to nine days before the campaign wrapped up. Um, to really allow for all of the, the stragglers and the people to, to have an opportunity to um, invest in, you know, and, and actually take part in the campaign. So just an example of you know, how sometimes digging into how your customers behave in general can also allow you to optimize for your emails uh, and, you know, make those email efforts even more concentrated and effective. And then, you know, sometimes the personalization, you know, especially if you're um, you know, working with, um, you know, businesses or um, ha have a, a little bit of a longer um, sales cycle. Um, th there are ways that you can, if you have their first name and last name, you can um, personalize the emails um, so that it puts in, you know, like a hi Ben, um, instead of just like, a, like, you know, hello um, and, and a generic message. So um, depending on, the, you know, how your customers um, like to be engaged, personalization tokens and um, or, you know, from a geographic perspective, right? You know, if, if I have a really localized um, strategy, maybe for this particular um, campaign, I, I only want to send an email to people who are in Cleveland um, um, or so on and so forth. So you can start like segmenting and being a little bit more concentrated in your efforts too. Great, and you know a couple of other. I just wanted to share a couple of you know just at large growth strategies that 
um, we've also done at Honeycomb to, to drive more um, invest, um, investors and collect more emails in general. So this is more of the top of the funnel um, effort that gets us um, to their email address. Uh, so, so one of the things that, um, that you can leverage is um, running giveaways where um, in order to enroll in, in the giveaway, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they need to give you um, their email address. Um, so one of the things that we did um, in the early days was um, run kind of like these, like um, we, we'd pick a food and we'd run like a PGA pretzel giveaway or like a PGA like empanada giveaway. So we'd take um, maybe the top 10, um, like, you know, top 10 pretzel um, restaurants or businesses um, in Pittsburgh and kind of run a mini competition. So we'd, you know, we'd just create this landing page and then we'd um, reach out to the businesses and then the businesses would post it on their social and then all their customers who wanted to, them to win and vote um, would come flooding in um, and signing it up. And you know, we, as an incentive, you know, we would, whoever, um, you know, whoever um, like put enrolled and joined that giveaway, they were enrolled in a raffle um, for a chance to win a gift card um, to whoever the winning business was. So just a little, uh, this was a way that, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, who's most likely in the community to be investing in small businesses, right? And we immediately thought about that, like eat local, shop local movements. And it felt like, you know, very natural to connect, uh, invest local as kind of that third component of it. So, you know, just an example of um, when you know that audience of um, who you're trying to reach um, on your emails, um, then you can you know, also think a little bit about what they might be interested in and where they might be hanging out um, you know, in um, their daily lives um, to really tap into these people. So you know, with these giveaways, especially with the pretzel ones, it was like crazily popular that it shocked me a little bit. Um, so for this one, we actually got, I think around like 1800 email addresses. Um, just from this um, like one week um, giveaway with like 10 different <laughs> pretzel businesses. So uh, like, you know, I, it, this was my idea to run it, but I have to admit I was a little bit shocked by the results. But, you know, I think Pittsburgh just, <laughs> we, we just love our pretzels uh, a, a lot. Um, you know, so, you know, that's just one example of where you can, you know, grab a lot of email addresses at once, and then the next step, you can start nurturing them, right, like, let them know a little bit more about what Honeycomb or your business does, and um, get them to, you know, convert into your own customer, too. And then, you know, some of the other um, ones as well, you know, for event registrations, if you're running an event, um, and after a, the event, and like add all those folks to your newsletter. Um, you know, same for webinars. Um, they've already shown that they've you know engaged with your content in a really meaningful way. Um, so might as well you know put them on the newsletter and start um, growing those efforts. Yeah, and then finally, downloadable content. I already talked about this a little bit um, earlier, but you know if there are these you know, free deals um, or you know valuable pieces of content. Um, that your customers would be interested in, then you know, creating this um, downloadable way to do so is just an easy way for people to go straight into your newsletter. Now, a couple more, um, just like at large use cases that you can use um, these emails for. Um, you know, we had previously talked a little bit more about your, you know, your traditional, um, you know, go go make a purchase or go make an investment kind of email. But there's also a lot more different ways that you can intentionally, um, you know, create these um, emails and really, you know, and really aid with your day to day. Um, so, you know, for one, marketing automation is a tool that, like, I, I always um, stress and really encourage. So, if there is, you know, uh, basically, um, um, if it, it triggers something, right? Like if you set up a trigger that says, you know, if X person. Um, you know, signs up for my newsletter, um, then, you know, send them um, like this other thing. Um, so so it's, instead of you having to do all of these things manually, um, you can just create these pipelines for people to engage with you um, directly. So a good example of that is having that like welcome email drip. So for someone who um, joins our newsletter for the first time, um, you know, we, they get an email immediately, you know, welcoming, welcoming them to the hive and sharing a little bit about what we do. 
Uh, and then a couple of days later, they get email number two that you know, talks a little bit more about the um, impact of um, investing in a local business. Uh, and a few days after that, we focus more on maybe the, the ROI. So talking about, you know, you can get five to 12% um, interest and really earn an attractive rate of return. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to you know, think about it. It's kind of like building a curriculum, um, honestly, um, and thinking about that full journey of them getting to know you for the first time. What, what are the things that you can really do to either you know, address their objections or create more delight um, into and excitement into um, working with you? Yeah, same goes for lead nurturing on, you know, in a more traditional like lead generation um, pipeline, right? So uh, <clears throat> a lot of it is um, delivering educational content um, all towards that goal of signing up, um, you know, for a demo, scheduling a call. Um, th these are ways that you can really engage people who are a little bit earlier in the funnel and um, really get them across the board. And then, you know, finally, you know, geographic segmentation. Um, if you do ask for like zip code or like states and things like that in your signup, um, and if it's something that is important to you, then you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like use those segmentations to send emails particular to those um, folks. So maybe it's, you know, give me, um, you know, create a list of people whose zip codes range from start with 15 to 17. That pretty much gives us um, all of Western PA versus, you know, maybe if I'm trying to reach someone in Philly, um, then hitting that like zip code starting with 17 to 19 um, is going to be the range that um, gets um, me to it. So this is definitely one of those things where um, you've got to think ahead early and start asking for that information so that later when you are ready to use it, um, then you can create that list um, very easily. Yeah, and then finally, sometimes you know, special offers and um, that can be more of a silver bullet um, solution. Um, so one of the things, um, if you see the GIF here on the, on the right, um, every single year for Small Business Saturday, we do our um, one sale of the year where um, we drop all, drop all um, investment fees on the platform. Um, so this was part of a like 10 email, um, email grip that we did um, pretty much you know, like in the week um, leading up to Small Business Saturday um, to really you know, educate and build excitement um, for investors about this new, um, about you know, this once in a year chance to, to invest without fees. Um, and you, know, you can really do a concentrated effort um, to drive sales in a particular um, seasonality. Great. And then I think, you know, as you're also building and creating more emails frequently, um, creating processes to, um, uh, to track and plan out the email is going to be really important, especially if it's more than just yourself and you're you know, working with a, a team of marketers to um, plan out the content. So uh, I, I think, you know, for us, we um, do weekly, um, uh, yeah, we plan our, our content weekly. So at the start of every Monday, um, we decide on what the schedule is going to look like, um, both for emails um, as well as um, social here. Um, so I have a screenshot here. It's more of our what we use to track our social, um, but we, we've created kind of like this really uh, robust and comprehensive dashboard in Airtable, um, which you know, tracks what it is, um, what the status of the different pieces, you know, what channels do we want this to go out in, um, what's the copy and you know if there are any images that we want to create in it. Um, so so um, you know just an example of you know if you are yeah I, I put this up since you know we we only send out emails maybe two to three times per week um, but you know for a lot of the daily folks especially you're going to need something that's a little bit more robust um, to um, keep track of all of these um, different things. Um, so yeah you can all like. I think calendars are very like build what fits for you and what works for you. So um, just you know think about what you need to um, you know publish the emails. Like you know if you if you need to get approvals um, for us, for example, because we're regulated by the SEC, we need a compliance check over every single uh, email and social that we create. Um, so you know when we're thinking about um, needing reviews and communicating that out and really making sure we're sending things out 
uh, efficiently. Um, that having this kind of system where a lot of different people can go in and um, build their feedback and review is, is going to be really helpful. All right, so now it's time to put it all together, and, and we have a little bit of a exercise here. Um, um, for um, so for the next ten minutes, um, spend some time to brainstorm an email that you'd want to send out to your newsletter, and you know draw or write it out on paper. So uh, we're going to go the the full stack here. Um, you know, brainstorm what you might want the subject line to be. Um, if there's a one email section or multiple email sections. Um, you know, what, what are the key things you, you, you want to um, write and convey to folks? Um, think, uh, of course, about the call to action. So what are, you know, what are you going to be linking people to? And, you know, if you're going to put a, like text on the button, what is it going to say? Um, if images are applicable, um, you can brainstorm and write down some ideas. Um, and then finally, um, decide on an A-B test that you, you'd want to run, right? Like, what's, what is it that you're most curious to know about your customers and uh, the different angles to that? And um, pick two of them to um, run an A-B test on. Or yeah, pick one of them to run an A-B test and make two versions. That wasn't clear. Awesome. Any, any questions about the exercise? No questions about the exercise yet, but I think we do have a few questions that may be helpful for you to to answer as folks are working. Absolutely. Um, the first question that we got is, are you finding that the open rate is even less useful now, uh, considering the most recent iOS updates that are making that data point a little less uh, accurate or harder to track? Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really great question. Yeah, I think in, in general, um, we don't even really look at open rates um, anymore. And um, click to open rate is kind of the, that north star we um, look at, especially with you know a lot of these reporting softwares. They're they're close, but we also notice you know say for like um, tracking the number of uh, number of opens for HubSpot, right? Sometimes the numbers are actually inaccurate, and it's because someone has their tab open and constantly refreshing that um, it, it reads as if there's you know more than there's more than one um, opens or like, yeah sometimes you see like 20 plus opens and sometimes it's it's a little bit of a of a noise kind of a factor so um, yeah I, I think um, given we, what we know about the ratio that it's just the number of opens over the number of full delivers it really doesn't show the full picture so I would probably lean like um, CTOR or the click to open rates um, entirely and just ignore um, some of the other things. And then as far as A-B testing, if someone were to run it themselves and not, not be using something like MailChimp, is it typically 50-50? You send it to 50% of your audience and the other to another one. And if that is the case, do you have any suggestions on how to track that if you're not using something like HubSpot or MailChimp that does it for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I would say, yeah, A-B tests are always 50-50 because -50 you want to have like an even and randomly selected um, audience for both of those things. Uh, I think, or this is more of just me bringing in like my stats background, but I think the um, like the sample size of 30 is usually the smallest that, that you can be. Um, so, um, you know, um, that being, you know, 15 each. Um, so, so if it, it, I think it's more about a, a size, as long as you hit that criteria, and I, I might just go even like 50 people, 50 people um, in, in general to, um, yeah, to, to allow for a little bit more of a significant um, results. Um, I think if I were to do it manually, um, if, if you do have an email list, one thing that you could do is um, either use like a random list generator and just have have it, um, yeah, have it reorder everything. Um, and then just, you know, take the first 50%, um, put it in one Excel sheet, um, and then have the, the rest um, be group B. Uh, I think the only thing with that is you, you would have to be able to see or have a way to track who opened the email, um, right? So maybe if you are using, say, like Boomerang, 
um, or or something um, like, like an extension like that that allows people to, you, you to see who opened your email address, um, then it might be, you know, that might be a way to work on it. Um, but that being said, if I think if you are at a point where uh, an A-B test is significant, um, then at, I think you're, you're also probably at a point in your business where having an email marketing software is going to be um, valuable in general because you know sending it out to 500 people over Gmail is going to be a little bit rough and challenging. And MailChimp is already so easy and already free that um, I think, um, yeah, I, I think um, it's probably at, at the point where you're ready to run A-B tests um, significantly, um, you're probably already on a platform of that size. Ah, I think we have another question. Um, have you seen any efficacy in putting personalization tags in the subject line or is it uh, is the start of the email better? Yeah, it's a really great, great question. Um, I think, um, you know, for us, uh, it's, it's a little bit of, um, yeah, when we're sending out investor emails, um, so le letting investors know when you're getting repaid and things like that, we very much put um, their first names on it because it really does help, you know, for folks to see their own name on it and be like, oh, my God, it, it's time to get paid or um, something that's really um, exciting and personalized. So we, we use it quite often in our, yeah, in our outreach and communications with like um, existing investors. So for folks we, whom we know their first name, um, for sure. Um, I think some of the challenges, um, especially uh, with more of a, a big news, newsletter, um, is that sometimes people opt out of putting their first name um, and things like that. So there are sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes it, it could get challenging if you don't actually know their, their first name or it's better. And in that case, I think it's better to just leave it out um, the door um, than, than like, try to put in you know, something that might, might not be right. Um, I think, you know, given your question of like subject line versus um, email, I think it, it really just de depends on if you think having their first name in the subject line will drive that um, click into it, um, right? Because I think that's where it, if you feel like it's going to motivate and encourage people to open the email at large, then uh, I think um, in the subject line makes a lot more sense. Um, that being said, like every situation is very different. Um, and, you know, sometimes what we expect um, our audience to react as isn't actually um, <laughs> how they actually behave. Um, so as a kind of like a, a different example, um, we, we actually, we, we used to put in like emojis in the subject line quite a lot. And what we actually found was those emails actually have a, like a less of an open rate um, than the ones who, um, who don't have um, the emoji. And like, I think we maybe, you know, we're thinking, oh, like maybe the emojis for our audience made them feel like it was more of just like a, a generic um, marketing email. And, uh, but, but again, sometimes the results are, are really interesting. So um, what actually happens might be different from what your gut reaction might be. Great, and then I think Karen also mentioned any thoughts on how to segment um, a list. Um, so, so I think um, when it comes to segmentation, it, it goes back towards that idea of I mean, what's the most um, valuable audience um, for you that that makes a difference. So, like when it comes to creating emails and just content at large, it's about right, like um, delivering the right content to the right people at the right time. Um, so, so part of uh, I think is at the high level is really understanding, um, you know, like if, say if I'm selling a product, like who's the most likely to um, want to buy. So, so maybe I will I would create an email um, based on those behaviors. Um, like you know, Togo mentioned earlier, like there was an age range on one of her um, audience um, things. So. Um, you know, in, in that case, you know, if you do have data on the age range of folks, maybe that's how I would want to segment it. Um, you know, maybe it's, yeah, I think, yeah, by, by gender, there, there might be a little bit of a, <laughs> um, I've, I've got to yeah, do some research. I'm, yeah, I think sometimes that's where it gets a little bit blurred. Um, and, you know, if, if 
selling geographically or hyper locally makes sense for you than you know choosing something by the state or by um the, the, yeah the zip code might make sense for you but like that that i think all goes back to this idea of like why is this segment important to you right um because you know if me sending um yeah me sending this email to 18 to 24 year old is about the same as if they were 25 to 36, then maybe I don't actually need to, to segment at all. So yeah, think of a little bit broader about what the goal is for you to segment. Yeah, and Stephanie, great point about creative mornings. Oh, I, I used to, I, yeah, I used to go to those every month actually, <laughs> and uh, really loved uh, the audience there and just like the inspirational um, vibes uh, <laughs> before you know heading to Honeycomb and thinking about of how I might use those creative juices in my work. So <laughs> very full circle again. Uh, yeah, I think that it goes definitely goes back to I think branding and what the your audience is looking for as as well. Because you know, for financial services, if we're a little like too lighthearted, and um, I, I think it you know cuts down on our trust a, a little bit um, versus you know for someone else in a very different um, model or or company, it, it could be a very different um, yeah it, it would be a very different type of thing. Um, but really great point about that. Awesome. I think we're about at 10 minutes um, now too. Um, does anyone want to you know, share what you came up with and um, what kind of emails you want to send? All right, that's totally chilled too. Uh, I guess, yeah, so we just, uh, I guess, very last slide um, in terms of free tools to get started. Um, HubSpot has a pretty great like email marketing certification. Um, program so it's a couple of just you know pretty quick um videos that covers a lot of you know what, what we talked about today but in far more detail and you know how you can apply it in your own lives um so you know across the team we we've done um quite a few of these different like certification programs to um you know build marketing um, knowledge across the team um already talked about mailchimp quite a lot today um and i think the the last one is this website called Mills, which I actually found out on TikTok because surprisingly there are a lot of marketers um, doing um, sharing marketing tips uh, on TikTok. Um, so th this is a site. Um, it it's basically a search engine of uh, um, email marketing uh, from like national brands across the country. So you can pretty much like look at, you know, say what American Eagle is, is sending out on their deals um this week um without actually being unsubscribed so it, it basically grabs like you know all of these different um like yes yeah, sales and marketing emails um uh, from like brands that we all know and like puts it in a search engine so um yeah i, I found this recently and it's pretty great because you know i, I want to keep my inbox clean <laughs> but i also want to get some uh, you know inspiration from uh, other folks who are making emails so this was a kind of a, a surprise find for me recently that I thought I'd share. Awesome. So that is it from me today. And uh, I think we can open up to questions if anyone um, has any more or um, yeah, whatever Ben and Anya want to do next. Do we have any questions? We still have a, couple, a few minutes. This is your chance. I have a question Go ahead. Um, about subject lines. So usually I've gone with what you were talking about, concise copy and just getting to the point as soon as possible, making it very short. And like, I guess I'm sort of wondering any tips to make it pithy or like you said, a little bit clickbaity, like if we're having an info session and we want people to come to it and that's the goal is to get people to register for it, should the subject line be come to our info session on March 7th, or sh how could you judge it up? Yeah, definitely. I think one thing that I really like to do sometimes is just like read through my email uh, if as if I only had five to eight seconds and think about what's the thing that jumps out or pops out the, the most. 
Um, I think, you know, especially if it's with creative mornings, there's uh, like that sense of like mystery or, or excitement there. So uh, maybe instead of like, you know, come join here, um, it's, you know, like, you know, f finding some of those really interesting action items um, in, in terms of what you might experience um, at the event itself and then direct that um, into the, the subject line itself. And again, you know, this might be a, a good chance for, for that A-B test to, um, you know, do one version that's you know, more straightforward um, and then do one that's like, you know, <laughs> Um, you know, meet a trapeze artist um, um, or, or, or something like that. That's, that's a little bit more um, out of the box or, or crazy in, in that way. Hi, I'm Abby. Um, I also have a question. So I'm um, just starting with my marketing um, journey. And so um, we have different audiences, like we have our startup advisors and then we also maybe have like our customers but then we also have like, like I would say a third group so would you recommend starting our newsletters for one specific group or trying to create something that would cater to all groups in the very beginning stages yeah that's a really great question um I I think this based on those two or the audiences you mentioned it feels like the, the startup mentors um might want to see more of like the under the hood um, experience of like, you know, here's what I'm working on right now. And maybe they have more of a connection with, with you as a founder um, versus for, for your customers. Um, you know, and, and maybe it's more about um, finding out, out about new products um, or, you know, if, if they are, if you do see quite a lot of overlap um, in the two groups currently, then maybe it makes sense to just do one um, in total. I think at, at Honeycomb, what, what we did was, you know, we, I think we, we, we threw all the mentors um, onto our just like customer newsletter as well, just because, you know, every mentor I think could also be a, a Honeycomb investor. Um, so, so, so um, like, you know, the worst case thing they can do is unsubscribe. Um, but like occasionally we would send out um, just like a very different mentor newsletter to, to just those specific people, you know, saying here's you know what we've been like learning, what we've been working on. Like, you know, can you introduce us to um, you know accountants, or um, can you introduce us to someone else? So maybe it's um, starting with that concentrated effort of um, that customer newsletter, since you know you're going to be growing that um, eventually, and that that's going to be your closest thing to driving sales. Um, but maybe having a smaller segment of the startup mentors. Um, so you have these more like tangible founder asks that you can go directly to them with. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, any more, one more question. All right. Sounds good. It seems like we are out of time, but I wanted to say thank you so much, Sophia, for this wonderful and actionable workshop. I am definitely going to go and skim all of my emails and see if I can like read them in like, you know, around 18 seconds. So I highly recommend everybody else do the same. Remember that the recording of this video will be in our website so you can, you know, revisit, do the exercise, take your time really dive into all of the uh, points that, um, that Sophia shared with you today uh, to make a difference in your newsletter. And like, just like Sophia shared, just like really reach to that audience that, that you want to connect to and, and, and want them to do something, to, to click on something. So take that time and uh, continue learning. Thank you again, Sophia, for, for, for providing this wonderful workshop and your time. And I see you everybody at our next workshop. Have a good night. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining.